Good afternoon, you stalwarts. We're gonna we're gonna these are, uh, the, these are the real hard work. They folks. are the real hard working folks. And we're gonna bring this conversation back down a little bit to the ground level and what's going on in districts and certainly keep the focus on innovation. Um, I hope you've read Ken Kay's bio in the, the booklet. He's terrific, he's energetic. Uh, as my little notes say, if you don't know him, you're going to feel like you've known him your whole life after we get through with this discussion. He was the uh, founder of an organization called Partnership for 21st Century Skills and now has a new organization called Ed Leader 21. And that's what we're going to talk about his work uh, today as well as in the past. So we're going to start by having you, Ken, tell us about what Ed Leader 21 is because that'll give us a platform for our discussion. Okay. So um, some of you know that I was working on 21st century skills for, from 2002 until last year at the federal and state level. And I came to the conclusion that, uh, which none of you will be shocked uh, by, that if we didn't uh, start to help local school districts implement 21st century education, it was never going to happen. And um, uh, we can talk about the implications of the last panel on, on that comment in a minute. But, um, so I went around the country last summer and I interviewed 30 local district superintendents and I said to them, if we create a new group just to focus on local district implementation of 21st century education, what should it look like? And they came up with a pretty interesting idea, which is they said, we want you to go form a professional learning community for superintendents, for deputy superintendents, and for their leadership teams that are committed to 21st century education and help us bring us together in a social network, bring us together in an annual event, have us work together on implementation of 21st century education. You might ask, what did they mean by 21st century education? And we decided that we actually had to come up with a narrower definition than the one, the big framework for the partnership. So we used, uh, the, for the last two years, we've been talking about the four C's, critical thinking, communication, collaboration and creativity. Critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. And so that's what we're defining as 21st century education. Some of the districts are interested in global competence, in financial literacy, in tech literacy, and in self-direction. And we're also working on those four, but the primary focus is how do you build the four C's into uh, so how many districts did you get right out of the right out of the gate? Well, as of right now, we have 48 districts in 20 states. And what and what do in they in the last four months? And what do they look like in terms of I mean, what range of types of districts? Oh my goodness, we have uh, very small districts under 3,000. Uh, we have LA Unified. We have Fairfax County, uh, and a lot of districts in between. Um, uh, so it's it's a pretty broad range. We have the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Um, so it's private, it's some private schools. So it's, it's anybody who is interested in pursuing this notion of how you build the four C's into their district implementation. And how many kids are represented in that? Uh, right now, 1.3 million. million. Right. And so Hannah, what's your plan for growth? Um, our hope is, is that by the end of this year, we'll be uh, close to 100 districts. By the end of next year, somewhere between 150, 200. Our long-term goal is over five years, we want to be in 700 districts, which would be 5% of the districts in the country. So talk about what this work looks like on the ground. You've talked about the four C's, but how do you implement it? Well, um, we, ha we have created a seven-step uh, strategy. Um, and if you go on our website, edleader21.com, and you click on our approach, um, you'll see the seven steps, and they go from it's really they go from identifying these outcomes to creating a community consensus, which you and I've been talking about. How do you get stakeholders to really have this discussion? Can can I go off on that just for of one course, second because it's course. a it's a passion of both of ours. One of the things that as you t listen to the course of today's conversation, there's so many different topics that came up, a lot of which I wouldn't recommend be the be the basis of a community conversation about education. And what we found, we've been doing this 10 years, that when you focus on student outcomes, what are the capabilities that young people need to actually possess, that you can have a very, very productive outcome with 
parents, with community leaders, with business leaders, with your own stakeholders saying, look, you know, every kid wasn't a critical thinker, a communicator, a collaborator, and creative 50 years ago. That's what we now believe we need for our community. One of our superintendents, actually when we were in New York uh, 10 days ago, we actually had somebody from Virginia Beach. Jim Merrill, the superintendent in Virginia Beach, was so convinced that he needed to have a stakeholder conversation, he ended up putting a thousand citizens in the convention center in Virginia Beach to have this dialogue about what are the outcomes we need for our young people. And he says, um, you know, now it's not like he doesn't have a lot of work to do. He's now he's got to go implement. But he says, I feel like I'm on automatic pilot. My community and I are in agreement what it is beyond content mastery that my kids need to be able to do. So that's sort of step two, and then it goes from there to align your system, focus on professional development, focus on curriculum and assessment. So we, are, we have some districts that are at stage six and seven, and we have some districts that are at stage one and two. It's oh, projected. there they are. Oh, yeah, yeah. thank you. They're the steps. There they are. And so that's what we're working on. And we, uh, on the website, we've been developing tools for leaders to introduce these concepts. We now have about 100 pages of work uh, supporting uh, bo both in terms of explaining what they are, but also giving examples from around the country of how districts have done this work. So can these folks access that information without being a member of your? Uh, they can access, the, they'll find the seven steps on the website, but the, 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 the content for now is, 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 uh, is with our members. By the way, at lunchtime, yeah. you and somebody, I, I think it was during uh, Lydia's conversation, somebody in the audience said, there are no districts in the country comprehensively pursuing this. I almost jumped out of my seat. Um, there are some districts comprehensively pursuing this work. Um, Virginia Beach is a good example. Um, it's not that they have figured out exactly every piece of the implementation, but here's the point. They've got their entire senior team focused on implementing this comprehensively from soup to nuts. They're a realigning They've created, they're not exactly the four C's, it's a little different, but they have their own outcomes that their community has agreed to, and they're realigning their entire system to produce, to produce those outcomes. Uh, Catalina Foothills outside of Tucson's another district that has completely realigned itself and, and has followed this process to, to 12 outcomes. And in that case, they have redone teacher incentives based on those outcomes. So there are some districts that have viewed this work of implementing the four C's very holistically and system systemically. Well, and th beyond then, talk about some of the other tools and templates. Okay, so we, uh, we've created stakeholder outreach tools. Um, we've done some stakeholder tools, outreach to the business community, outreach to the school board. I think this uh, fall we'll be asked to create some outreach uh, uh, tools for parents. Um, we've also created resource documents um, uh, for example, 16-page resource document on the best resources for critical thinking, communication, collaboration. I guess the other thing to mention is the three projects we've just launched. Um, we were very lucky to get a small grant from the Hewlett Foundation, and they uh, uh, asked us to bring our first 20 leaders together, which we did in early March, um, to meet. And they said to us, we love what you're doing, but we want you to take on three other projects. One we're actually going to take all 50, 60, 70 districts, however many are, are, are in place by the fall, and agree to a common set of rubrics for critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. Um, secondly... What does that mean, Ken? Uh, in other words, we're, we're going to come Define up with a them. fourth, eighth, and twelfth grade, in effect, definition and get all 60, 70 districts. I was surprised they asked us to do that. I said, well, some of you already have them, and they said, well, but getting all the districts to come up with a sense of best practice, that will allow us then to decide, well, how do we between districts begin to assess and begin to compare assessments? Um, the second thing is they want us to develop the criteria for a 21st century district, and we're gonna take that on with the idea either that districts can self-assess or that uh, districts could actually, we could ultimately create a third-party certification designating a 21st century district. Uh, and then lastly, we've been approached by PISA, the College and Work Readiness Audit folks, by um, the folks at the AP exam and a formative assessment group out of California, whether our districts, because they're committed to 21st century education, would be pilot projects for some of the 21st century assessment tools that are coming. And so we're going to create a, 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 we're create a, um, 
a pilot project where any of our districts that want to be pilots for those assessment tools will be able to participate jointly in a, in a pilot project with those groups. We want to get to that example, but no, we hold on to that just a yeah. second. And um, let me ask you about how many districts do you think have embraced this notion of innovation? Uh, of art, you mean in general? In general. In general. What's the appetite for innovation at the district level? And well, what are, let me ask it the other yeah. way. What are the impediments or the barriers to doing this work of innovate, uh, of bringing an innovation agenda to okay. the districts? Can I add, can it, we'll go external, because I don't want to pr 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 presume anything. I'll tell you what I've found going around the country. Yep. How many of you that are still left, and I assume these are the innovators, by the way, but how many of you still left think of yourself as doing serious innovation within your districts? Yes. OK. So I, I would say that that's pretty reflective, that when I go and meet with 200 educators, I would say, now, the ones who didn't raise their hand, first of all, it's 3 o'clock, and we got to forgive them. They're just too tired. Uh, but, the, but the others, I think, is the issue of um, whether they feel they're in a position to innovate. Right. You know, and, and so what, here's the question, and I, I don't want to take too much um, umbrance with the last panel, but just let's ask the question and let you answer this. How many of you think that, well, well let me actually have you reflect on this. Those of you who are, who are innovating, about half the room answered the question. How many of you, well, where do you think you're getting your support for your innovation? Where is the support for the innovation coming from? Where, where, to the degree that you are currently innovating, where's the drive coming from? Is it you as superintendent? Is it your school board? Is it the community? Where, where is the, the drive to innovate coming from? Somebody. Students. Students, great. What else? Where else? Yes. Parents. Parents. Where else? Leadership. Leadership of the district. OK. OK, good. I am waiting for a specific answer. How many of you would say, yes, please? In the community, community conditions. OK. OK. How many of you are feeling nurtured and supported in your innovation by state policy? Come on, a little high. I know you're tired. And how many of you are feeling supported in your innovation by federal policy? One, okay. Give an example, please. What were you thinking? Great. Did you get it? Did you get an I three? Okay. 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 Great. By the way, when we asked this question in New York, nobody raised their hand for either. So I, I'm glad, I, you know, we know the I3's out there. But, but, look, but this is the thing that, yeah. I, that sort of I want to reflect on the day with you, which is, and, and I, I'll take some, uh, 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 some serious objection to the comments about the only way to innovate in this country is if we come up with one unified way of getting the work done. I don't believe that. I just don't believe it. Now, are we better off with a common core? Absolutely. But when I hear somebody say, we need a common core so we don't have differences, I go, are you kidding me? Are you serious? Let me just take us through that analysis and think about where we're going to be in five years. If the view is we're doing the common core because uniformity is the best way to go, how many of you think that global competence, I mean, I, I, uh, our, our, our friend, uh, our comments earlier from Susan Frost were fabulous. How many think global competence is important for your kids? OK. All right. There is no global competence in the common core. If you're waiting for the common core to establish global competence standards for your kids, it ain't coming. Now, does that condemn the Common Core? Absolutely not. What's the Common Core going to do? It's going to do fabulous things. And let me explain. Can we put up the slide? I, nobody thought I'd be here talking about how great the Common Core is. I want you to see something. 
This is in the example, this isn't a common core question because we don't have them yet. But this is even better for some of you. How many of you have, are actively involved in AP? Have a, a, active AP programs in your districts? Advanced placement? Okay, there's gotta be, okay. So I don't know if you know this, but the, the AP exam's going through huge redesign in biology because the National Academy of Sciences beat them up for 10 years saying, too much rote memorization, you gotta do something else. So here is an old question. Can everybody see this, by the way? Here's an old question from the old, you can't, do you want me to read it to you? You can't, you can't see it? The cre a look at this college level biology question. So this is what used to be on the AP exam. The creeping horizontal and subterranean stems of ferns are referred to as, and then it gives you five options. Okay, that's the old question. Okay, next slide. I'm not gonna read you this one. But here's, go read this for a second if you can, just look at it. This is gonna be on the new, don't write down the question for your kids. This is a question like this will be on the new. Okay, but here's, a, this is a fascinating shift between question one and question two. Look at question two. In the old days, they would have asked you to give them the formula, right? What's the formula for? Now they give it to you. Now they say, you gotta apply it. Take the formula and solve a question, solve a problem. One of the reasons we're, our kids are doing so lousy on the PISA exam is all the questions in this country are question one. What the kids need to be problem solvers and analytic thinkers is question two. So what's gonna happen in this country, which is why the Common Core is so important, and why the, this is the part of Jim Applegate's uh, comments I think are totally justified, is we can't afford to have question one education in the country when the rest of the world is teaching question two. And so the idea that we're gonna sh give this boost to everybody by, by, by focusing on question two education is important. So what's the takeaway for you all? AP exams and common core exams are tougher and your kids need to be better critical thinkers and better problem solvers and more analytic by the time these questions come. That's a good takeaway. I, I, I'm a huge fan of the Common Core for this purpose. But, let, I, I'm sorry, I know I'm, I'm talking too no, long. No, 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 you're let fine. Me, let me make one, one other point. But, but, by, it, what it's gonna do is gonna get us better critical thinking and it's gonna get us better communication skills. What, it, the, what I worry about the conversation of the last hour is, is that you're gonna sit there and go, we're passive recipients of the Common Core. And what that leaves me worried and what I'm working with my districts on is I think we need a model where the local districts feel actual full and equal partners in shaping a definition of the workforce. I disagree with Jim Applegate profusely, and why? Because the Common Core doesn't include collaboration, the Common Core doesn't include creativity, the Common Core doesn't include global competence, the Common Core doesn't include a number of things, oh, here's the beauty of, you really wanna get upset? The math standards don't include financial literacy. Okay, I'm not here to condemn the Common Core. I'm here to get you excited that the Common Core is gonna take you in the right direction, but you need to be an equal partner in fashioning the rest of the question, which is beyond communications and critical thinking skills, what do, what do our kids need to know and what do we as districts need to decide because the federal government isn't going to get it right. Tim, or um, Ken, Sorry. no, 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 let me just, because you and I have had this conversation about innovation at the policy level yes. and then what innovation at the level of where the practice is occurring has or hasn't occurred. Right. So it's not, I mean, if you think of the common core as being content, yes. right, then isn't it something about the practice that hasn't been in, you know, that needs to also be innovated. Um, I'm, I'm pushing on just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I don't think it's, I think the Common Core will take us towards some of the skills, just not enough of them. And so I don't right. want to say the Common content. Core is just about content, because okay, I, I think see. they've made an attempt now to embrace critical thinking and problem solving and communications, but I don't think that gets us everything we may want. And some of those decisions, I think local districts and superintendents are equipped to make. And by the way, I think that local businesses working with them, K 
can have a broader definition of workforce readiness than, than, than the Common Core may put out. And I think that's a healthy thing. Here's the thing I worry about. If you guys look at the PISA exam that's coming in 2012, they are building financial literacy. They're building what they call dynamic problem solving. Some of us in this country call it systems thinking. That's going to be in the 2012 PISA exam. It's not going to be in the 2014 Common Core. So it sort of puts you in a situation where you realize we, we are doing some things right, but the likelihood is we're building some of this stuff into a fairly inflexible, late response to what other countries are, are likely to get faster, quicker than we are. So that's why the idea that we're going to rely on the federal government to be quick enough when I think there are some leading edge districts, some of them are in our group already, that are taking the same attitude towards the Common Core that I think most people have took to NCLB, which is, it's a floor. You can't ignore it. You've got to get it right. But if all you do is NCLB, your kids won't be ready for the 21st century. What, and I your, feel the same way about the Common Core. Are your districts now, and do you expect in the future, seeing technology as a huge tool of this work? Yeah, although I think that, uh, surprisingly, because a number of us come out of a technology integration advocacy background, but I think we've been really good to say that we, we are not leading with technology. So what we would say is, and I, uh, um, technology is important because you can't critically think in the 21st century without technological tools like database analysis. You can't communicate effectively without knowing how to use the technology to communicate. You certainly can't collaborate without the technology. And you can't be creative in the 21st century without knowing how to use the technology. But what we have found is that in some communities, if you make the tech conversation and you try to go out with a tech levy, you can get it. In a lot, you can't. And so that conversation is actually, this is an alternative, which is you walk into that conversation and say, do you agree that your kids need to critically think, communicate, collaborate, and be creative? And they go, yeah. And they go, OK, well, we're going to help you get there. And technology's got to be part of that solution. So I, I, don't, I, I think we tend to think of technology as a tool to accomplish the four Cs rather than a huge goal in and, and of itself. And, and of itself. Um, are you thinking about questions? When Ken and I did this discussion in New York, People we didn't. At us. Well, we did. They were there. That's right. They were a little more aggressive, but we also <laughs> didn't have lights in our eyes, so we could uh, see people twitching who wanted to ask questions. So let me open it up and give you the question of: You've alluded to the role of the business community and mm -hmm. working with um, this strategy, and can you talk a little more about that? Yeah, I mean, in the communities, um, I think that the, not in every community, but in most communities, the business community has been very excited about this work and been a real ally. We have some districts where the business community is not that big a factor. But in most, if you talk to the business community about these outcomes, if you talk to the business community about the need for critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity skills, they're all over it. They get it. Um, so they can be a tremendous ally. and then and then, some of the businesses have been very, very creative in how they've partnered with our district. I, I don't think I talked about this in New York, but just one district comes to mind that happens to be from upstate New York. They partnered uh, in one case because they were very interested in financial literacy. They partnered with their federal, federal credit union, and the federal credit union set up a student-run credit union in the high school. Hmm. All of the staff of the, of the district banks at the student-run credit union in the high school. And that seems pretty impressive in its, of itself. Somebody's cringing. She doesn't want to have a 17-year-old uh, as a bank teller. <laughs> but, but, um, but here it goes a step further. The juniors and seniors who have come out of that program are now teaching financial literacy to the K through fifth graders as a result of having learned it by working in the credit union. I mean, those are the kinds of resources that I think you can untap and, and, and the fact that, I, I go back to the example, the fact that the Common Core doesn't have financial literacy in it doesn't daunt me to think that you as district leaders couldn't do something like that in your district. Why shouldn't you? And I, you know, why, why should we wait for the federal government another 10 years to get its act together and figure out that most students in this country want to learn math in the context of business and financial literacy, and we are allow, allowed the Common Core to be run by a bunch of math 
uh, 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 academics who don't consider financial and business liturgy, literacy to be part of math. I mean, you know, how, you can you do that at your own risk, but there are a lot of communities going, we can't live with that. Our kids need business and financial literacy. In fact, they want it. Test Ken, where, where do I see a question out there? Here's one right here. Yeah, Cheryl Gray with Advantia. Oh, nice to see you, how are you? Um, I'm very interested, Ken, in how you can compare today's context for 21st century skills to 10 years ago when the scan skills came out and a lot of the curriculum innovation that you're speaking about in the business partnerships occurred big time across this country. Today there seems to be less traction for it and I'm interested in your appraisal of the context. All right, just so you know, we're, we're, time is flying by because the scan skills are 20 years old. Um, the scan skills came out in 92. The partnership came out with our framework for learning 10 years later, which, was at, which is now a decade ago. So here's what I'd say, I, and actually uh, Arnie Packer, who is sort of the grandfather of the scan skills, had, uh, I happened to intern for him when I was in law school, and so I've kept, a, uh, I viewed him as a mentor for us. And we've had many, many conversations about, I think, that the 21st century skills movement has been wildly more successful than the scan skills, I personally. And I think he would agree. And the reason is, one, we focused a lot more on marketing it. And number two, um, we got lucky, which, you know, oftentimes you just got to be lucky at the right time, which is, and none, we didn't know this in 2002, Thomas Friedman hadn't written The World is Flat. Mm -hmm. And that whole conversation about globalization and the impacts of globalization hadn't occurred. If it hadn't occurred, I think we'd be where the scan skills still are. I think instead, um, we, we have a rampant, by the way, do, do, you, do you tweet? Uh, are you on Twitter? So just go and go every day, I do this every day, and just search 21st century skills today and see what comments you get. There are, there are 40, 50 comments a day. There's a very, very robust conversation still going on on 21st century skills. I don't think it's, it's gone away. I, here's what I would say that I, I would agree with you. I think the business community, and you can watch this over the course, is split on what its advocacy should be. I think there's a piece of the business community, and I have it in three buckets. The first is that they started the NCLB movement and they're totally devoted to accountability in a very traditional sense. And we should come back to that, because I, I did want to talk about this issue of innovate, innovation, uh, in, innovation to what end. The other piece is a lot of the business community is still stuck on STEM, although if they want to make it, uh, some of them now to make it more acceptable, they've called it STEAM, they've added art. Um, but th there, there's now that bucket. And then I think there's still a very sizable group of, of people that are pursuing the 21st century skills conversation. I, I would say it, it is running a distant third to the other two conversations at the CEO level, I get that. But I think we've been at this 10 years, and I guess what I've been finding in the last five months that I've been doing Ed Leader 21 that's been stunning to me, the first 20 districts that joined, I knew them. The last 30 districts that joined, I didn't even know them. I mean, they came to me out of nowhere saying, we've been doing this for three or four years. And actually, I had a couple people walk up to me today during lunch saying, we've been following your work for three or four years. So, I think it's actually out there and people are, have been following the framework and now we've got a professional learning community to bring those groups together if people want to. So I think that's encouraging too. Matthew? We have from the, from the listening audience a clarification request. If you could clarify for them, step two, who are the people included in community? If I take us back here, creating a community consensus, uh, there's clearly, I mean, you, you addressed part, uh, this in your discussion, but they were looking for clarity on that, if you could. Okay. Um, so I think there's internal stakeholders, teachers, administrators, staff, parents, school board, that is your internal educational community and then external stakeholders, the business community, the broad community. Some, some communities have gone and talked to seniors, some have talked to taxpayers. So I think you can, I think you need to envision it as both an internal and an external uh, community. And, um, and I think some of our districts have been very aggressive with both. Question? Ken, you wanted to. I wanted to go back, yeah. yeah. It, it, when we had the, uh, the conversation um, with, um, 
uh, Lydia Logan at lunch. I thought it was really interesting that, uh, and, and very powerful, the degree to which they have found districts that have really devoted themselves to continuous imp improvement around student achievement. And I, you know, I've found districts like that where you go, God, it's very, very powerful. When she described that Georgia district that is just pounding uh, student achievement and getting the whole culture. And by the way, it's so funny, two of the superintendents I've talked to that are the most successful in the country on 21st century education also have 17-year tenure. So hmm. there's some huge advantage when you can hmm. be in a district that long and, and have a, a vision. But what, what struck me about the conversation was, and I actually walked up to her, on her uh, as she was leaving, that they're innovating on the issue of continuous improvement strategies to get student achievement right. But they're not innovating on the issue of the definition of student achievement. They consider that static. In fact, they're looking back 10 years and going, where's the data on whether we've driven numbers? You know, and, 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 and I'm, I, I, again, I'll say, I'm a huge fan of No Child Left Behind for a lot of reasons that Cindy Brown articulated. I think it's been a fundamental civil rights issue. However, what we, it, those of us that have worked with the business community ought to have known, and we should have known this right away. A lot of us knew it right away. When you start taking metrics, you usually don't get them right at the beginning because you usually start taking a snapshot of whatever's lying around. So when we started NCLB, the metrics that were lying around were content metrics. And they were 50-year-old metrics. And by the way, if you can use 50-year-old metrics to find underperformance, we just have done it. We've identified underperforming schools using 50-year-old metrics. It's worked it, it, to the degree that we wanted to find underperforming schools. What's not worked is if you ask a second question, which is, is every kid ready for the 21st century? You can't use 50-year-old metrics. And so the idea that bro I'll just say it boldly and get mm -hmm. in trouble, the no. idea that Bo Broad and Gates are driving their agendas primarily looking through the rear view, up until this point, looking through the rear view mirror of pre-existing metrics is a problem. To the degree they know that's a problem, they're now going, oh, it's the common core. That'll get us out of this rut. Well, only if you think the common core is flexible enough and far-sighted enough to keep pace with other countries. And that's where I'm off the boat. I don't see it. I don't see the common core. I, I think the, I gave you the best case you, you're gonna, you're, you've heard on why we need to do the common core. That second question is where the common core is headed, and that's, we should all be excited about that. So I'm not going to back off of my support for it. But you as districts need to be have a broader view than the Common Core. You need to leave here thinking that we got to go back home and figure out what are the skill outcomes that the Common Core may not ask us to do that we have to be committed to anyway and get our kids ready for those two because the Common Core is too narrow. So do you think there is an innovation agenda that is discernible now in, edu in education? Well, or the uh, notion that we need one and that yes. we're working on one. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think we got to be hard on ourselves because I'm not sure within this room, and I, I view this as obviously because they stayed to hear you and I, the best people the in the The thought leaders of the, the uh, yeah. Um, I, I don't even know that we would have an agreement with all of us about what is true innovation and what isn't. And so one of the things I think we got to be hard on as we go forward and that's one of the reasons that we've set ourselves up to focus on the four C's, is to say, are you being innovative about implementing your old goals? Or have you set a, a, a set of new goals that, so that what I would say to you is, from my perspective, the innovation agenda needs to be about the right set of student outcomes. And that's what we, a lot of people have not been willing to have enough of a, of a conversation about. And so, you know, from the broad perspective, you get into trouble because they don't have 10 years of data on collaboration skills. They don't have 10 years of data on creativity skills. They don't, and so I don't blame them for being upset about that. But as you and I said, we've got to figure out how to help people get through where you don't have the data. You can't tell people not to do it. That's not stopping Europe. It's not stopping Singapore. And so for us to box ourselves into a narrow view of 21st century outcomes because we don't have 10 years of data to justify it is going to put us in a, in a, in a, in a 20th hole. century box. Yeah. 
Can it, is there one more question from the audience to close us out? They've been so patient. I know, I know. Ken, you want to give us a benediction? Um, <laughs> it's, too, it's too wonderful an offer to, to, uh, to exactly. pass up. So I, 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 guess what, I, I guess what I would say is, is that I've been, on, you know, I've been on the road now since 2002. And um, uh, over the course of time, I started the Partnership for 21st Century Skills focused on federal and state policy. I've left this decade of my life completely convinced that if local superintendents and their leadership teams are not supported in their work around innovation, that the country's not going to innovate. And even if we get the Common Core right, and even if we get 40 states adopting it, I, I, it, it actually saddens me when I ask, are you feeling supported from state and federal government for your innovation, and we get one hand raised. So I, I guess where, where, where I'm, and that's why, by the way, when I went to the superintendents and I said to them, what can we do to help you? They said, help us band together. Bring us together once a year, bring us together online in a social network, because there's a small group of us that are prepared to innovate, regardless of where our state policy is headed, regardless of where the federal policy is headed, because we don't believe that those policies right now by, them, by themselves will get our kids to where our kids need to be. So I guess I want to say to you is if any of you are here and feel like you'd like to be part of that PLC, uh, write down on your card, Ed Leader 21, and I'll get you some information because we're, we're in a position where we want to find those leaders in the country that are really committed to the four C's, committed to having a group of innovative districts working together to implement. And we'd love to have you join us. And I just want to say today's been a terrific day. I've been here since 8.30. It's been, I found, have found it a terrific day. I want to thank you on behalf of all of us. Thank you and Edwig for oh, a wonderful you're... day. Join me in thanking Ken. Thank you. You stay there. Okay? All right, I'm, I'm going to go to the podium just because I feel a little more stable. To thank you all for, for staying through the day. Um, I think it's been a really wonderful day, and I hope it's caused you to think about some next steps in your own districts and in your own work. Um, I, you know, here are a few of my, my closing thoughts. We know this is extremely messy work. Um, I, Ken and I would compare notes at various times through the days and realize there was even kind of dissonance in panel, within a panel, much less across panels across the day. So, which is to only underscore, I think, how difficult this work is and how messy this work is, whether it be that we could have tied this all up with a bow for you and been helpful, um, that helpful. But I'm going to leave you with three overall observations. Um, number one is I'm struck by the disconnect between the rhetoric on innovation and the reality of what's going on at, on the ground. Uh, and you all know that much, much better than I do. Um, it's kind of sub to that is the idea, the, where, where I feel that disconnect is particularly between the need for deeper learning and 21st century skills on the one hand, and then on the other, the kind of drill and kill realities that are, uh, in, are um, um, our, the requirement of our accountability systems, whether at the state and certainly the federal level. There's also this idea that we, and we didn't hear it as much here in Chicago as we did in New York, but this idea that we want there to be so much happening and so much trust going on at the local level, and again, at the same time, there's this just kind of mush and deadening that comes from um, the, the top-down approach. And I'm not a top-down naysayer. I don't want to leave the impression that I think policy, either federal or national or um, state, is, is at all not important to the equation. Um, my second observation is, though, I'm a, real, I'm a very optimistic person, and I do see the world through pretty rosy glasses. I do think we have, we have reached a moment in time in, in K-12 education. Common standards have been mentioned several times, this whole work around what next generation assessments will look at, like. Kind of interestingly, the idea of tight budgets, I think, uh, provides an opportunity. There's an economic imperative behind um, getting 
some next work around um, reforming education right. There's a focus on developing human capital, whether teachers, school leaders, and others. And finally, the power of technology provides for this moment in time that I think is unlike anything we've seen in the past decade. And I would say there is uh, something very important happening with the innovation agenda. So this is my, my third takeaway from the day. And I'm especially intrigued with the idea, and this comes from you, Ken, that we need to empower superintendents to be engines of reform. So even as I've talked about the kind of um, important but sometimes deadening um, uh, feel from what's coming on high, it really is the local superintendents and district folks and folks in the school buildings and classrooms who I think can be engines of reform. So let me circle, let me end my little bit of the day by circling back to the notion of deeper learning, the idea that education should be about equipping students to become better learners, not just about arming them with facts for the time they'll be asked to cough them up on a sheet of paper or a bubble test. The bottom line is that students need to master a core of knowledge that they retain and understand and find relevant and that they can apply, apply critically and creatively working on their own and in groups just as they will in their future lives and careers. So let me thank you all for joining us today. Thanks to our sponsors who make these uh, forums possible, to our great speakers, some of whom I would even term rock stars, and our wonderful audience for making this day possible. Matthew um, has already let you know, but our next series of uh, forms will be in the fall, October 4th at the Hyatt in Philly, and the, on the 7th we're going to be back here in Chicago downtown on the Magnificent Mile at the Marriott. Um, we're going to be talking about technology specifically in that forum. So thank you all very much, and here's to you. I just want to wrap with our virtual audience and those in the room. If you could, be sure to provide us your evaluation forms. For those watching on the uh, live stream, we encourage you to send those in at the end of this um, broadcast. We look forward to those of you who are watching in the archive to also evaluate this program. Thank you very much. You can leave these at the registration table. Thanks for your time today, and we'll see you in October. Yeah.